And we begin tonight with the dangerous Arctic blast gripping a huge portion of the country and now causing a state of emergency. New York woke up to an April snowstorm Monday morning, leaving about five inches of snow on the streets. Uh, East Cleveland is down two of its three snow plow and salting trucks. When this freezes over tonight, this will be a nightmare for residents here all around the city. And when it stops, we're expecting here in Chicago upwards of 10 to 12 inches of snow. And if we get that much, it's going to pretty much shut the city down. For cities that have to deal with snow, a big storm can be paralyzing. What if there was a better solution to clearing the roads than sending out the fleets of plows and salt trucks? What if the solution to snow could lie in the pavement under our feet? There's a startup in Alaska working on that very scenario. We picked Whittier, Alaska because they just get overwhelming amounts of snow. That's Tim Allen, president of Arctic Heat Technologies. You know, it is not uncommon for them to have 20 feet of snow on the ground. The main snowblower in the city has a, a mouth that is, uh, you know, somewhere in the vicinity of 10 feet tall. They have to be very careful not to stop it over the top of a manhole cover because it can suck a manhole cover off the ground and through the and through the chute. Tim braves this extreme snow for a reason. He needs it to test his new technology, which he's embedded in four unassuming pavement slabs that he showed us outside his office in Anchorage. These are the test slabs that we brought back from from Whittier. They are two feet wide by eight foot long. Um, it's tough to make four slabs of concrete sound exciting. But you know what is exciting? Tim's come up with a way of heating up these pavers by inserting strips of carbon fiber under the concrete. And they call it tundra tape. Mmm, I love that. Tundra tape, like uh, something a superhero would use. Yeah, it kind of looks like duct tape. But it's still like a super tape, right? That's true. It does have super functions. Because it's made from carbon fiber, it can heat up super fast. And that means snow won't be able to build up on our streets at all. Think about how hard it is to drive, catch a bus, or just walk down the sidewalk after a snowstorm. And how life-changing this could be for the elderly and people with disabilities. That's why Tim, he's betting that once they get tundra tape out there, it'll catch on fast. If you have a section of, of sidewalk that's free of ice and snow, and right next to it is one that does have ice and snow on it, people start demanding that there is no ice and snow. You get this uh, avalanche effect. It's really just the beginning. There is so much else that our pavement could be doing. Like what? Well, that's what we're talking about in this episode. Welcome to City of the Future, a new podcast from Sidewalk Labs. Each episode, we look at an idea or innovation that could transform our cities. I'm Vanessa Cork. And I'm Eric Jaffe. And on this episode, we're unpacking the innovation that will make snow melting, light changing, permeable roads possible. Modular pavement. Hi, Kara. I found Chris. Hey, Kara. How are you? I'm going to shove this microphone in your face. Lovely. Cool. Can you say who who you are and what you do at Sidewalk Labs? My name is Chris Sitzenstock. I work at Sidewalk Labs as part of the buildings group. And I'm Kara Eckholm, and I work on Public Realm. Chris has spent his career experimenting with building materials, from carbon fiber and racing yachts to inflatables at Google. And Kara came to Sidewalk after conducting urban ethnographies on how people use public space. And they are now the pavement people here at Sidewalk. I oddly stare at pavement a whole lot more than I ever did in my life. Chris and Kara have been exploring the pretty incredible things that pavement could do. I mean, like we made a list of about 150 different like innovations that you could do with pavement. And a lot of the challenge was whittling down to the areas where we think there's the potential for biggest impact. For us, the holy grail of pavement includes modularity, heating, lighting, and permeability all tied together. So why are you guys calling this the holy grail? Well, I think we're calling it the holy grail because it's really ambitious and it represents the ideal, but it's very hard to achieve, just like the holy grail. (laughs) So when you talk to people in the pavement world about this, what you're trying to do, how do they react? I think the reaction is initially... You can't do that. That's really different than how things are done today. To understand why this is such an ambitious departure from how we do things today, we should go back in time to the roads of yesteryear. Um, So, Eric, I know that you wrote a book on the first road in America. I haven't read it yet. But you bought it, right? I don't care if you read it. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> okay, sure you did. The first thing you should know is that most of America's early roads were totally unpaved. They weren't roads at all, really. They were just dirt paths. In early colonial towns, they had an annual road day. So once or twice a year, every colonist in the town had to come out and smooth out the dirt, pluck out the big rocks... They mostly spent the time drinking and having foot races. It sounds like fun, but not a terribly productive way to, to make a road. That is correct. There really wasn't any serious road work done in America for a couple centuries after. Cities started to explore different approaches in the 19th century. You had in the 1820s, there was a Scottish engineer by the name of John Loudon McAdam. And he started laying down small crushed stones on roads. And when you put these stones together you ended up with a very smooth surface. It was great. Cities loved it. They called them macadam roads. Now, later on, they realized when there were buggies going over these roads and there was dust being kicked up, that was actually wear and tear. So the engineers, they added sand and they added tar to make yet a new type of road, and they called it a tar macadam road. We call it tarmac. Okay, I didn't know that's where the word tarmac comes from. Because you didn't read the book. <laughs> exactly. And then, obviously, there, there was also asphalt. And, and even though asphalt had kind of been around for centuries, in the 19th century, Americans consider it a very modern innovation. And so for the National Centennial in 1876, Washington, D.C. actually paved 54,000 square yards of Pennsylvania Avenue with asphalt, just to prove how advanced our capital was. Okay, so that, that means that we are still paving our roads with the cutting-edge technology of 1876. Karen and Chris, they've been on the hunt for the cutting-edge pavement of the 21st century, and they think they've found it. Modular pavement is pavement that you can quickly pick up and replace. So if a slab breaks, you don't need to tear up the street. You can just replace that slab. Or when you need to access an underground utility, you pick up the slab, do your business, and put it back. In her research, Kara came across some pioneers who have figured out how to make modular pavement work. A government-backed agency in France called IFSTAR. The French Institute of Science and Technology for Transport, Spatial Planning, Development, and Networks. That's a loose translation um, and certainly a long acronym. Yeah, but it, I mean, it definitely sounds better than roads department. So how did IFSTAR get into modular pavement? You know, French cities have a huge issue of accessing utilities, which were buried years ago and are often kind of a mess. So they started developing this removal urban pavement prototype. The researchers at IFSTAR set out to design a new system of modular slabs. But these kinds of pavers require a different shape to make them light enough to lift up and move around, but still strong enough to handle a load of trucks. So they had to look outside the standard square and rectangle. So the ideal prefabricated paver would actually be a circle, but that doesn't work when you're trying to put the pavers next to one another. And so a hexagon is you know, somewhere in between a square and a circle is able to distribute the load more effectively. You almost get a honeycomb effect. One of the reasons that bees use the hexagon is because it's strong, and so the aesthetic and the strength are, are very related to one another. So how strong are we talking? Actually, this pilot road in, in Nantes, France, they have not had to do any maintenance over a 10-year period because of the integrity of their slabs. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. We have to see it to believe it. All this rain. Looks like it would be pretty if it weren't so rainy, though. It was pouring when we were in France, and it got so, so, so wet. Every day we have a storm. Really? Yeah. The primary person uh, we spoke to, his name is Thierry Sadron. Um, he is the father of removal urban pavement. So like, well, does, he, does he just self-describe as the father of removable urban pavement? You know, he's modest, so he probably wouldn't describe that way, but um, it's very clear when you meet him that this is his baby. <laughs> so how far away is the test site? Oh, it's uh, 10 minutes. Oh, great. Perfect. We, we, we just have to cross the, the, the big bridge. And... There was a break in the rain, and so before we actually started our meeting, um, we drove over to the removable urban pavement deployment. So this is like the, the, like the city maintenance department here? Yeah which is a location that they chose in part because it has a lot of trucks drive over it, so it was actually a really good place to test the integrity of the pavement system. There's kind of a basketball court-sized deployment of these hexagons, which we were all super excited to see. I mean, 
these hexagons, this deployment, that was really the star of the show. It was the point of our trip. Um, so we stood there in the pouring rain, walking back and forth. We made a truck driver go over just so we could see. Perhaps with the small truck. Elbow drive for us. Chris the whole time was staring at the wheels rolled by over the pavement slab to make sure none of the pavement slabs were moving. I asked them if I could walk on it and they were like, yeah, you can walk on it. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> it's pavement. <laughs> yeah. You know, we had just met. I didn't want to cross any boundaries. If you take a, a sucking pad, you yep. can remove it very easily. So it's so no, what, what, no maintenance over a 10-year period? No maintenance. Absolutely no maintenance. We were happy to see that the site, the pavers, looked brand new. Like, was that the whole point of this pilot? Is that what they were hoping to prove? They're trying to prove that over the long term, you see substantial savings in maintenance related to removal of urban pavement. And that also when you account for the social cost and quality of life improvements, that removal of urban pavement would blow conventional pavement out of the water. The folks in Nantes are focused on modularity for a very practical reason. Maintenance. But maintenance isn't the only problem modularity can solve. In the nation's fourth largest city, floods are a way of life. It's pretty scary. I've never seen anything like it. So why is the Bayou City so vulnerable? One study found the Houston area has added 25% more pavement over 15 years. So we got too much concrete, I think, is what part of the problem is. Water doesn't have any place to go when something like this happens. We think it's really important that the streetscape is permeable. Because cities have been so paved over, when you see hurricanes in Houston, for example, there's such major flooding because there isn't sufficient drainage. So the pavers are going to be part of a larger flood mitigation strategy where we have more parks, more green space integrated with the pavers. I mean, which is sort of the beauty of the modular system of like, can you, can you, like you take out 10 pavers to grow a redwood and you take out two pavers to grow an apple tree and then you sort of get what you want in that system. Modularity is the cardinal rule of technological development. You make pavement modular so it can evolve over time. So if you're adding technologies, when they become obsolete, you can simply replace them. With modular pavers, you could put in a technology that could change up your whole streetscape without lifting a single slab. Lights. Um, There's different ways lights can be used. You can make one ways when you want them to move traffic a certain direction and then turn that faucet off and like you don't need it anymore. So the lights are for turning car lanes into pedestrian spaces. Yeah, I, I think it might be more like a mentality where like you're just guiding pedestrians. And then maybe your lights are like your ground traffic control system. If there's all these different lights changing under your feet, I mean, it's kind of like you're walking on Times Square, and it could be a little disorienting. Is it? Is How could the light system be organized in a way that it doesn't feel like a frenzy or a circus? I think this is a point of argument we get into a lot here. People want almost like a video screen below their feet so they could communicate in this very dense way. And then, I mean, like my sort of school of, of thought is you want your lights to communicate with like the least possible means like making a poem with like the least possible words you can so it's like the best communication you can with five words okay so all this stuff together it's it's lights permeability heat modularity this is the thing you're calling the holy grail right i mean this is a lot of stuff to ask out of a pavement slap Yeah, no one's really tried to combine all these things at once, which, I mean, no one's really tried to do many of these things separately, either at scale. So both individually and combined, they've never been done. So we're definitely in new, untested territory. So if it's all new territory and you don't know what it's like, what does it look like when you imagine it? Walk us through your future city street with these pavers in place. And if you could coordinate all the modules the way Chris Sittenstock wanted, (laughs) what does that street feel like? question um stock street yeah um it would be great like if you had like your bike lane that was like trees on both sides that almost felt like a forest and then like you sort of open up and then like hopefully at 7 30 at night and there's a big concert going on 
people are like done commuting. You don't need all three lanes going, and right. maybe it's one lane. That'd be right. a fun block party, and you could have the speakers <laughs> playing the music <laughs> and through the pavement. Yeah, with no snow. Okay. Well, what about you, Kara? What does Eckholm Street look like? So perhaps my vision is not as fantastical as Chris's, but I would love to be able to ride to work in the morning on my bike in the middle of winter because there's no snow um, because it's been melted. That snow would then melt through the permeable pavers and lights would tell me how fast I can go so I can get there more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So like in your ideal day of the future, you're just getting to work faster. (laughs) I'm getting to work faster, but I mean, it's more generally a a much more pleasant experience. I'd be excited about riding my bike in the middle of January. You know, pavement is the, the skin of the city. It's really influential in terms of people's sense of place and creating a character around the built environment. And cities are, to some extent, defined by their pavement. So you have Berlin with its gray granite slabs. You have Lisbon, which has these small black and white mosaic-like tiles. You have New York, which is mostly known for its gum on its sidewalk, so maybe not the best example to emulate. But pavement defines the identity of a place. It makes a difference. I think most people view pavement as something that's really mundane. But then when you think about your favorite cities, Most people do remember the pavement. Thank you for listening to City of the Future, a podcast from Sidewalk Labs. Your hosts are Vanessa Quirk and me, Eric Jaffe. We are produced by Benjamin Walker and Andrew Calloway. Mix by Sharif Youssef. Many thanks to those who helped us make this episode possible. Kara Eckholm, Chris Sitzenstock, Thierry Sedron, Tim Allen, Kara Oler, and Claire Mullen. Our art is by the great Tim Cow. Our music is composed by Adam James Levine Arity. If you want to hear more of Adam's work, you can check out his band, Lost Amsterdam, at amsterdamlost.com. To learn more about Sidewalk Labs, visit our website at sidewalklabs.com, where you can subscribe to our newsletter at the bottom of the page. See you in the future. Bye.